Okay, then I'm going to get started. So uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, hopefully, you are as excited about this and this field as I think at least myself and uh, Vala and Hung are. So I'm going to try to give a, a short intro and overview for the next 20 minutes or so. But rather than uh, try to give like a historical account or, you know, do a worse job explaining the research of our esteemed speakers than, than they will when they give their talks. Rather, I'm going to try to answer um, three questions for you guys. The first is why we're doing this, essentially. Why are we hosting uh, this workshop? So what is the recent breakthrough that's happened? Uh, or I should say breakthroughs, really, uh, that have motivated this workshop? And uh, then, you know, why is that important? And uh, what is the reason that I think it's caught a lot of uh, media attention and there's been an explosion of research over the last year or so, followed up by then, you know, what, what I think lays ahead for the future. And that one will be a little bit of my personal opinion, of course. Um, but by the end of this workshop, informed by the discussions uh, with our speakers, hopefully we, you know, will have a, have a new list, essentially, and a new map. So to do this, I'm first going to have to give you a little bit of background uh, on uh, four topics. And it's going to be a little bit high level. I'm not going to deep dive into anything. Again, the speakers are going to do that at a much more technical level. And again, since we have so many uh, people, uh, I think there's, I know there's a lot of students and I think there's people from different backgrounds. So I'm going to try to keep this uh, more understandable. So the first thing that we need to understand are quantum materials, because they're going to play an important role, especially later on. So what is a quantum material? It's a vague, it's a vague description. Uh, generally, and I think the definition I like the most is it's a, it's a material who's not best described classically. And I know that that encompasses a lot of things, and that's fair. So we, we do use the the catch-all term quantum material to talk about, let me try to turn on the laser pointer here, to talk about topological materials, um, spin liquid candidates, uh, let's say wild semi-metals, Dirac semi-metals, um, strongly spin over coupled materials nowadays, and of course, uh, superconductors. Because superconductivity, which we'll talk about next slide in more detail, but it is inherently a quantum mechanical phenomenon. So there are are, and I want to point out especially, a lot of 2D quantum materials. And I, I point that out because these uh, exfoliatable layered materials, um, probably most famously, I think everybody is familiar with, for example, graphene and the honeycomb lattice. They're especially important nowadays because we can do a lot with them. Because we can peel off, you know, few layers or very thin flakes, we can stack them on each other and make artificial heterostructures that aren't essentially findable in nature. And so because of that, we can now access a different part of essentially a, a compositional regime on the phase diagram that wouldn't have been possible before. So this includes, you know, uh, twisted uh, effects that I think, uh, or not I think, that some other speakers will talk about and like twisted bilayer and trilayer graphene and other materials with mare lattices, but it also encompasses stacking of, for example, uh, different layered materials on top of each other. So for a, another example we'll talk about later was NBSE2, a known superconductor that few layers were taken and then stacked on top of another 2D quantum material, in this case, uh, niobium bromide. And so an uh, artificial heterostructure was able to be made that that uh, has some interesting effects, as we'll see. So some more examples of these quantum materials, of course, there's graphene. Uh, I, the one that's very near and dear to my heart is uh, tungsten ditelluride, which has, again, sheets of a, hexa a pseudo hexagonal lattice of tungsten coordinated octahedrally in a deformed octahedra by tellurium. And then uh, since we're talking about superconductors, of course, the famous uh, 123 superconductor, YBCO, um, is a rather layered material with um, the copper oxide square planes being very in, important, as we know, for, for that superconducting property. So the second piece of background I need to give you guys is, of course, a little bit about superconductivity. What is it? 
because we're here to discuss non-reciprocal superconductivity and the superconducting diode effect. So the superconductivity was first found really by Kamerling Onis in uh, here in the Netherlands, not too far actually from where uh, we are here in Delft at Leiden. And it was found in 1911 in mercury. And at 4.2 Kelvin, the resistance that he was measuring suddenly and abruptly dropped to true zero. So this means uh, below that critical temperature and below a critical current that you essentially have no scattering, um, no energy loss, no heating. You have a lossless conduction. And how this comes about, at least classically in terms of BCS theory, Bardeen Cooper Schriffer, is through the formation of uh, Cooper pairs. And now in BCS theory, this Cooper pair is formed by the interaction of electrons with each other through a mediating phonon. So in this very ancient cartoon, you can see that an electron might be flying through the lattice. It due to electrostatic inter, uh, electronic uh, attraction, it attracts a positively charged lattice center slightly, deviates it from its ideal position that another electron flying by will notice. And so those two electrons are essentially coupled. Now, superconductivity is actually really important. Uh, even though we don't think about it that often as being super important, it's actually important in your, in your life. So of course, we all have all seen this picture where a magnet can float above a superconductor and it's a very cute lab example. But more than that, you know, people are in Japan, for example, are levitating trains. So the maglev uh, train, there are several uh, stretches of this train now, but the big, a big one is being completed by 2027, going all the way from Tokyo to Nagoya. And uh, eventually it's going to be expanded to Osaka, even in another 10 years after that, and in other parts of the world. So it's a, it's a very efficient form of uh, people transporting. But superconductivity is also the basis of very, very sensitive sensors. And so that brings us to the third piece I want to give you guys, which is talking about the Josephson junction. So instead of just now talking about one superconductor, now we're going to talk about two superconductors that are separated via a barrier. So this barrier is essentially not superconducting. Now it can be a weak link in terms of a constriction or other things, but for the purposes of this discussion, let's just think about it like a, a non-superconductor. And what happens is that you have a superconductor with its Cooper pairs and essentially a wave function I can write down to describe that those Cooper pairs and another superconductor with a similar wave function. And if the barrier is essentially not too wide or the channel length is another way I'll phrase that. If the channel length is not too long, then the two wave functions can couple together. And the result of that for which Brian Josephson won the Nobel prize uh, for describing this scenario back in, I think 19, or he did in 62 or something and he won it in 72, something like that. Uh, the results are the Josephson relations and the idea that, yeah, you can tunnel um, still without resistive loss. You can still superconduct even across a non-superconducting barrier. So you can tunnel supercurrent across. And uh, now that the difference between it and a single superconductor is that in the junction, the current that goes across is modulated by the magnetic field that this, this junction experiences. So how that modulation happens uh, is a deeper subject that we're not gonna go into right now, but it results in essentially a variety of Josephson effects, the DC Josephson effect and a Fraunhofer pattern, as well as the AC Josephson effect where the current uh, will oscillate as a function of time if a constant uh, voltage is applied across it. Now, these junctions can be made in more than one geometry. You can have a planar geometry where you had like a superconductor and another superconductor separated by a plane of a material, or you can have a vertical junction where you have a superconductor and then a layer of material and then the other superconductor is beneath it. And this one is gonna be important for uh, in a, maybe three slides or so. Now, the reason we, one of the reasons we talk about this is because Josephson junctions are important. Um, they fame form the basis of the squid, which is famously the superconducting quantum interference device. Uh, and that 
is one of the ultra sensitive sensors I was talking about, uh, where essentially instead of one Josephson junction, we take two Josephson junctions and put them in a loop. And now as the magnetic field goes through the area defined by that loop, for example, you can get an even more sensitive uh, dependence of the current that you measure as a function of that applied field. So sensitive, you can detect magnetic fields down to almost 10 to the minus 15 Tesla, which is less than the human brain's field, which is why this idea and Josephson junctions actually form the basis for the MRI, the magnetic resonance imager that is so important uh, in medicine today. But Josephson junctions are also found in dark matter detectors. Uh, this is ADMX. It's a, a attempt to detect the dark axion. It's found in uh, these sort of sensors are used to try to find oil, for example, because it can detect magnetism so precisely that it can essentially find different types of minerals. And we have learned that different concentration deposits of different minerals are associated with the presence of oil. And uh, it's even already being commercially deployed in computers. Josephson junctions are the basis for, for example, D-Wave cells, these, uh, these RSFQ, which is something we'll, uh, others will talk about later, but rapid single flux quantum based computing chips that already have a million Josephson junctions on a single chip. So this idea, Josephson junctions are very important. And the last but not least, I think, is of course, they form the basis for today's superconducting qubits. Um, every type of flavor you like, uh, I don't remember what they're called, charge, flux, phase, or something like that, they all actually have Josephson junctions at their heart because that's how we can approximate the two-level system. So I'm trying to convince you Josephson junctions are important. Now, the last piece of background before we jump into uh, where we are now is non-reciprocal because I talked about, I said, we're going to talk today about non-reciprocal superconductivity and the diode effect. So what is reciprocity? It's a very important idea in physics, and it's a simple one. It's just the idea that if a signal goes forward, it's going to come, it's got to come backwards in essentially the same manner. In, in transport, most of us are familiar probably with the Onsager relations and its relation there, but it has a rich and deep, uh, per, uh, it pervades all types of physics really. And uh, it's also important even in electronic circuits, um, it governs most of them. And uh, it uh, sets a lot, of, a lot of the operating characteristics. Now, non-reciprocal is also simply defined or can be simply defined as the forward and backward flows being different. Now to realize non-reciprocal behavior, you fundamentally need to start breaking symmetries. <clears throat> and uh, essentially, if you break inversion symmetry, you can start to do this. Uh, probably the most famous example that I think everybody will be familiar with is uh, the semiconducting diode, which uh, is in the, or realized as the PN junction. Now this surely is in somehow, in some form, it's in every single device that you use in your life. And uh, it's based on the idea of taking two semiconductors um, that are doped differently. So one has more electrons than the other. One has more holes, one has more electrons and slapping them together. And you get a depletion region and essentially internal dipole or, or built-in field that uh, again, breaks symmetry. Now in a single crystalline system though, you also need to, to break time reversal symmetry or as maybe I think one uh, speaker will mention later, you can also, you also need electronic correlation and dissipation. But in any effect, I, way, the diode effect, as in rectification, is one of the most basic demonstrations of non-reciprocity in conduction. And that's this idea of if you apply, for example, a sinusoidal waveform, so both plus and minus, so in a, as function of time, you, you delete essentially half that wave. So the negative side, for example, is, is disallowed. So non-reciprocal conduction is important for many components in modern technology, from gyrators, isolators, circulators for quantum computing, active transistors, it's all over the place. From wireless transmitters, like I said, all the way to quantum computing. So this is a really important idea 
And it's been uh, thought of for a long time to realize non-reciprocal superconduction. And recently, so now we're putting all these ideas together, this has kind of been uh, realized in, in, uh, intrinsic, in an intrinsic manner, in single devices. So it's separate than something else that uh, I believe Bala is going to bring up a little bit later, which was probably first realized in the 80s using multiple devices. But focusing on this workshop, which is primarily based on single devices, back in uh, around, I guess it was 2017, one of our speakers, uh, Professor Nagaosa, who I'm thrilled to have here today, uh, talked about this idea of to break or to realize non-reciprocal superconductivity, uh, there are a few ingredients you need. You need to break inversion symmetry, like we mentioned. Then you need to have in spin orbit coupling that splits uh, the spin degeneracy. So once you break inversion symmetry, you're allowed to split spin degeneracy, but then you need something to do that splitting. Spin orbit coupling is, is, a, is a way. Then you need to break time reversal symmetry, usually by applying a magnetic field, so making K you know, not equal to my negative K. And then you need to have a nonlinear response. So for example, uh, current being proportional to the E squared under B. So this is gonna be important as a couple of speakers talk about later for the magnetochiral anisotropy effect. And uh, in 2020, um, I believe this is maybe the first time I think it was realized by another one of our speakers. So we really have a, have a kind of the who's who list today, but by Professor Ono and Ando et al. They realized this uh, using a stack of an inversion symmetry breaking stack of thin films of he relatively heavy metals, particularly the tunnel. So they had the spin orbit coupling, they broke inversion symmetry, then they applied a magnetic fields and they broke time reversal They've had a magnetochiral uh, driven response. And sure enough, if you look closely, you can see for a current, let's say the forward 6.6 .6 milliamps, so a positive current, for a magnetic field direction, they're superconducting. And if they flip that magnetic field from negative to positive, they stop superconducting and so on and so on and so on. So in this uh, heterostructure, they, were, they observed a delta IC which is a term you're going to hear a lot of, a, a difference in the forward versus backward critical currents, i.e. a diode effect, which comes from non-reciprocity. Non so uh, that was with magnetic field. Now, very recently, uh, Hung is going to talk later, uh, and Yao Jia, uh, postdocs in actually my group, so this was our recent work, <laughs> um, realized this effect without magnetic field in a quantum material Josephson junction. And here the idea was they took two superconductors, a uh, two 2D superconducting material, so niobium disulfide, and they put them around and made a sandwich using a third, or I guess, yeah, third layer, another quantum material. This is a niobium bromide. And I think they'll talk a little bit about why that was a special material later. But the point is the stack broke inversion symmetry. Um, and it has spin orbit couplings, significant spin orbit coupling. Niobium and bromine and selenium are not light elements. And they found a similar rectification of an applied uh, current. But in this case, they found it without magnetic field, which is a bit confusing because I told you before, you need to break time reversal somehow. Uh, so there's an open question is, where is time reversal being broken in this device? How is this happening without magnetic field? So we'll hear from some of our uh, theorist friends as well who have some uh, proposals on what's really happening in this device. And we'll hear from Hung about how he proved this, uh, this response. But uh, I just threw this together. So please don't feel offended if you're not represented on this laundry list, but I just wanted to show that there has been an explosion of realizations. Um, like I said, there, this has now been seen in a twisted uh, bilayer and trilayer graphene, in, a, in just some nanowires, in another uh, quantum material um, that I forgot exactly what it was. I think it was an iron germanium something, uh, and a europium based one. So, so now the, the gates are sort of open, and material scientists uh, are working with physicists and attacking this. And there's a lot of uh, possibilities on the horizon. So 
what's the sort of status of the field right now? Um, this a superconducting diode effect has been seen with field in bulk superconductors and in thin films of superconductors. And how that has come about, what mechanism has driven it? Uh, we're, we'll hear another uh, about another one called finite momentum. We already talked a little bit about magnetochiral anisotropy, but there's a lot more there than what I just briefly described. Like I mentioned, uh, Vala and others will talk about uh, classical Josephson junction circuits, so combinations of Josephson junctions, um, and and how in those circuits you can you can also realize a diode effect. And now, very very recently, it's been realized both with and without a field uh, in various types of quantum material Josephson junctions, where the idea is that the quantum material with its intrinsic quantum properties can modulate superconductivity across a junction because superconductivity is also a quantum phenomenon. So what else is out there? You know, that's, that's the question I leave to you um, in the audience. Uh, and hopefully, you know, you're inspired through the next uh, two days of talks to, to find even new, more and exotic um, realizations. And uh, some of the potential benefits though of, of all of this is that having non-reciprocal superconductivity enables circuits that are can be operated essentially in analogy to known semiconducting non-reciprocal circuits with the added benefits of course that there we can potentially save a lot of energy because of course no resistive loss the superconductivity it's known can be turned on and off very fast in principle now in practice there are some limitations but you know that's the next another direction of research a fun direction is how to how to really realize that high speed. But in principle, this it was shown that terahertz switching can happen um, in, the, in the late 80s or, or early 80s, as it were. And of course, size, you know, especially using 2D materials now, um, we can make channel lengths on our just a few nanometers and they're operating out of plane, not in plane. So really the out of plane footprint is limited by your lithography, not by the operation channel length. So uh, there are several interesting questions to ask. Um, fundamentally, how does all this work? Like I said, you're going to hear from a variety of you know, expert theoretical speakers who are going to talk about different mechanisms. Um, from an experimental standpoint, an obvious direction to go is to increase TC. A lot of this has been shown at reasonable temperatures, so above uh, like, you know, helium three. So some of, a lot of this has been shown above two Kelvin, but it'd be great to show it above 77 Kelvin. Then we're really, then we're really talking because that's liquid nitrogen cooling requirements. Uh, of course, tuning Delta IC and the IC in general, um, we'd love to engineer that for different applications, uh, different, it's not necessarily just bigger is better. And of course, scaled fabrication, um, especially with the 2D materials. Right now, this has been shown on a 1Z, 2Z level, a handful of devices. How do you make, you know, a million on a, or a billion uh, on a single chip? That's, that's a non-trivial question. And of course, more non-reciprocal devices. You know, any good workshop should end with the question of what lies beyond this workshop. So what lies beyond the diode effect? You know, maybe, maybe we'll make a Josephson transistor next. So there's a huge open door, um, in my opinion, and this is my speculation, but they say, right, if you're holding a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Um, to, I a, have a material science background, and to me, almost all of these questions are a question of finding the right material. So with that, I'm just going to acknowledge some people uh, who did the particular research that uh, I, some of the particular research um, I talked about. So Professor Tyrell McQueen and postdocs Yaja and Hung, and of course Vala and Hung um, and all the other speakers in this workshop. And uh, thank you for listening. <laughs> thank you, Maas. Um, I think um, we have time, since we started three minutes after 11 uh, or 10.30 my time, excuse me, we have a minute uh, before transitioning. Um, there's a question in the chat um, uh, Moha Gupta asks uh, a naive question about no energy loss. Um, the, recti the rectification is still resistive in one side and so will generate heat. True, sorry. Yeah, I was uh, glossing over it. So really what I mean is no resistive loss 
essentially on one side. And, uh, you know, if you define what's on and off, um, since now in the traditional, let's say, on state, when current is flowing, it's no resistive loss, you can still save quite a lot of energy. And people have done the uh, calculations, like I said, back in the late 80s, when there was a big effort at IBM for superconducting, traditional superconducting computing. And despite the uh, cooling requirements, they decided that if this was implemented, especially at larger scale, so like supercomputers or uh, centralized computing facilities, that there was actually a, uh, almost a factor of 100 times possibilities in terms of energy savings, especially now uh, compared to today's um, you know, high power density operations. So there's more we could discuss later, but, but that, that's a short answer. Great. Um, and it appears we don't have any other questions for the moment. I think um, it's a good timing to transition to our first 